I'm actually a new member of the board and I'm going to be the continuing education person. Charna has passed the baton to me. So I get the pleasure tonight of introducing our beloved rabbi who uh, actually took a trip back to, for some of us, um, the home country. something more about the Baal Shem Tov and his influence. And one of the things that we've been doing as part of uh, this movie, which we're hoping is going to come out at the end of the year, um, I was hoping that Chuck uh, Davis, who's the director and producer of the movie, was going to be here tonight, but he's not able to be here, but he has um, given me uh, a, an edited version of a, of a 10 minute clip of the movie but it's not really um, the movie, I mean it's just like something that he threw together <laughs> so hopefully if, if our techies here can work out how to play this video which we've not been successful to get working yet uh, we can show that later at the end but one of the things you know I opened by just now by singing a nigun, singing a melody and um, this movie is a combination of um, our journey to Ukraine, which is primarily what I'm going to be speaking about tonight. This incredible opportunity that I had to visit the, the sites of some of these very important people. But it's also been about um, some interviews that we've been doing over the course of, of the last few months. We've interviewed some very amazing and wonderful rabbis and scholars and teachers and just asking them the question who is the Baal Shem Tov? Who is the Baal Shem Tov? And one of the questions that we always ask is is there a nigun? Is there a melody that you associate with the Baal Shem Tov? And um, as many interviews as we've had, we've had as many different nigunim. <laughs> but I can assure you that the nigun that I just sang is the true, authentic <laughs> of the Baal Shem Tov. There's an amazing story about Reb Dov Bear, otherwise known as the Magid of Mezrich. And according to tradition, it was really the Magid of Mezrich who was the primary disciple of the Baal Shem Tov and the one who, more than anyone else, disseminated the teachings and systematically set up all of the different Hasidim, all the different dynasties to be able to uh, continuing, continue the legacy of the Baal Shem Tov. And there's a story about the Magid of Mezrich. When he went into Mezhiboj, 
he was a great scholar, a Kabbalist, a very learned man, and he went into Medjugorje because he'd heard about the great Baal Shem Tov, and he wanted to check him out and see if he was the real deal, as it were. And so he arrived in Medjugorje and he came into the presence of the Baal Shem Tov and he was just kind of standing there a little arrogantly, just like, you know, as if to say, come on then, give me what you got. Let me, let me see if your Torah is true. And without really even looking him in the eye, the Baal Shem Tov said, you know, I was once on a very long journey and I was so hungry and I didn't have anything to eat. And we were going along and along and along on the journey and eventually a peasant on the road threw us some bread. And then he stopped speaking. And the Magad of Mezerich went, really? This is the great Baal Shem Tov? So he went home to the inn where he was staying and started to doubt all of the stories that he'd heard about the Baal Shem Tov. But the next, the next day he came to see him again. And again the Baal Shem Tov threw him off with some parable about being thirsty on the road. <coughs> and the Muggad of Meserich was pretty incensed that he'd made this long journey. He wasn't called the Muggad of Meserich then, he was Reb Dovbeh of Meserich. And so he went back to the inn and he said to his shamas, he said, you know what, this is a waste of my time. As soon as the moon is full in the sky and scattering the clouds, get the horses ready, we're leaving town. But as the moon rose, a messenger from the Baal Shem Tov came and said, the Baal Shem Tov wants to see you. And so the Magad of Mezrich went into the presence of the Baal Shem Tov and he said to him, do you know Kabbalah? And the Magad said, yes. He said, okay, take this book. The book was Eitz Chaim. Take this book and start reading. So he read. Now stop. Contemplate what you've read. He stopped. He contemplated what he read. Okay, now explain what you just read. And he started explaining. And the Baal Shem Tov just looked at him and he said, You know something? You have no real wisdom. The Magid was insulted, of course. And Baal Shem Tov took the book and he started reading the words of the book. And suddenly, the room filled with fire and smoke and angels and there was so much going on in that room that the, the Magad of Mezrich was overcome and he fainted. And when he woke up from his faint, he looked into the eyes of the Baal Shem Tov. And the Baal Shem Tov very lovingly looked at him and said, what you shared was absolutely perfect and right in every detail, but it had no real wisdom in it because it didn't really come from your heart. It didn't really come from a place of deep understanding. And so, from then on, the Magad of Mezrich became the primary disciple and eventually the successor of the Baal Shem Tov. A similar story about Rabbi Yaakov Yosef of Polnoy. Rabbi Yaakov Yosef, Yo <laughs> Rabbi Yaakov Yosef of Polnoy was uh, the rabbi in, a, in, the, in Sorogod at the time. And he went one morning, as he did every morning, to the, to the synagogue for Minyan, and there was no one there. There was no one there apart from uh, the, the shamas. He said, where is everybody? Everybody's uh, in, the in, the, in, the, in, the, in the market. There's a stranger coming to town and he's, he's, he's telling stories. And when, when he tells his stories, you can't, you can't help it. You just have to, you have to listen. What? <clears throat> he's telling stories at this time when we're supposed to have a minion? We're supposed to be davening? We're supposed to be praying our morning prayers? How dare he? You go tell him. He has to come immediately to come and see me. And so the shamas sort of walks out and he and, and there is this stranger in town who guess what is the Baal Shem Tov who's telling his stories and, and, and he says to him my, 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 my master the rabbi the Rabbi Yaakov Yosef says that um, you, you have to come and he was like well I'm just finishing my story and he went back and he said well he says he's just finished he said, how dare he what impudence go tell me he has to come with me and he went back and he said he says he really wants to see you now he said okay I'm coming and in a very leisurely way the Baal Shem Tov takes his time and he goes before Rabbi Yaakov, Yaakov Yosef and Rakov Yosef is fuming by this point. He says, how dare you? Who do you think you are? You come into my community. You take away the faithful people of my community when they're supposed to be doubling their morning prayers. Rabbi, it really does not become a man of your stature and your learning to be so angry. Instead, 
Why don't you just listen to a story? Listen to a story! How dare you tell me to listen to a story? Rabbi, anger is not a fitting quality for a man like you. <laughs> listen to a story. And eventually something about the tone of the Baal Shem Tov's voice, he couldn't help but listen to the story. And the Baal Shem Tov says, you know, I was once on a journey. I was on a journey. And we had pulling along the carriage three horses. Each one was a different color. And no matter how fast we went along that journey, no matter how fast the horses were galloping, they didn't neigh. They wouldn't neigh. They wouldn't let out a sound. And then a peasant on the road cried up to us, loosen the reins. And we loosened the reins and those horses started to neigh and neigh and neigh. Immediately, Rabbi Yochav Yosef started crying. He wept. His heart was split open and he realized that the story was for him. And that as brilliant a scholar as he was, as great a teacher he was, he had had those reins way too tight and he needed to loosen the reins. Mm. And he too became one of the most important disciples of the Baal Shem Tov. So I want to open with these two stories because each of these stories tells a story within itself. Here was a figure who we know a limited amount about historically, who had some impact on the Jewish world at that time, that made even the greatest scholars, some of them, open their hearts to a different kind of Judaism. He literally lit a fire. The story of the Maggid of Mezrich becoming his scholar, his, his disciple, the Baal Shem Tov lit a fire. He lit a fire in the heart of the Maggid and, 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 and transformed him. He transformed a very learned scholar, Yaakov Yosef, into, into a disciple, into a chassid. And so part of this journey that we've been on is trying to get a sense of, well, who was he and what is his influence and who, is to, who does he teach for? Is he just a, a teacher for people who remain in the Hasidic world? Is he a teacher for all Jews? Is he a teacher for all people everywhere? And part of, I think, the motivation of, of Chuck Davis, whose vision it was to make this film, was really to um, put the Baal Shem Tov into, onto a, a stage, if you like, of world wisdom leaders, to say this is someone who had a very, very important effect on the world. Until quite recently, people in the academic world thought that uh, the whole Baal Shem Tov thing was all bubamisis, that he didn't, there wasn't, he didn't really exist, it was all fantasy, because the primary material we get about the biography of the Baal Shem Tov is from a work called Shifchei Chabesht, which is really a, a series of, of very powerful stories that are written by his disciples, and they are in the realm of fantasy a little bit, and so scholars didn't really take them seriously, and so they wondered whether even anyone existed, but... Um, a very important academic um, in Israel called Moshe Rosman actually wrote a book called In Search of the Historical Baal Shem Tov. He went to Mezhibozh in Ukraine and he looked at town records and so on and so on and so on. And without going into lots of historical detail, he has is, he is essentially pieced together a picture that yes, indeed, there was a, a, a rabbi called Israel Baal Shem Tov who lived... Uh, in Ukraine who was born in approximately 1700 and died in approximately 1760 and his primary influence was in the town of Mezhibozh from about 1736 until the end of his life in 1760. So that's, we have that, we know that there are stories in those town records that he was definitely um, seen as some kind of healer, some kind of uh, mystical figure that Jews and non-Jews alike went to for, for healing. Um, and all of that is now coming from, from the historical world. So there was, he exists. We now know that he exists. <laughs> so I'm gonna, I wanna now um, show this, this slide. Oh, before we show this slide, I just want to, so here, my, here, just interject me a little bit. So me, Mark Soloway, who um, used to be an actor and discovered Hasidic stories, and in discovering Hasidic stories, and primarily the Baal Shem Tov, I made a big 360 leap, and I really would say that my discovery of these stories was what helped me make my transition from being an actor to being a rabbi in a very deep way. So these stories have always kind of lived inside me. And what's fascinating is, and I've shared this before in what I've written, and I, you'll see some of it in, in the clips of the movie too, if we can get it working. Um, 
what I've shared is that so many of these names, Yaakov Yosef of Polnoy, the Magid of Mezrich, Rabbi Nachman of Bratslav, the Baal Shem Tov, of course, himself, uh, Pinchas of Koretz, um, uh, Mordechai of Chernobyl, Reb Zusha, all of these names, mm -hmm. and even the places where they're attached to, because most of them are attached to Reb Zusha of Hanipol, right? The Magid of Mezrich, Reb Nachman of Bratslav, all of these places have been mythical landscapes for me. They've been places that have existed in my imagination as very profound places within my imagination, some kind of spiritual realm. And so I was kind of nervous that going to these physical places and all of those names that I've just mentioned, I, where I, I was at the graves of every single one of those rabbis and more that I just mentioned. You know, the, tr the trip that we went on took us from uh, Kiev to Breslov, um, which is where, uh, to, sorry, Kiev to Uman, which is Rebbe, where Rabbi Nachman of Bratslav is buried. From Uman to Bratslav, where his primary student and disciple Rabbeinu Natan is buried. Then we went to Nemirov, which is where very good Ukrainian vodka is made. <laughs> <laughs> and then from there we went to Mezhibozh, which is where not only the Baal Shem Tov is buried, but also Baruch of Mezhibozh, the Baal Shem Tov's grandson, and uh, Degel Machanai Ephraim, a very important Hasidic rabbi, is also Baal Shem Tov's grandson, Rabbi Wolf Kitzes, who was one of the, uh, his disciples, and, and the Abdu Rav, who is Rabbi Yehoshua, uh, Abraham Joshua Heschel of Abt, who is the, the great grandfather of the Abraham Joshua. Joshua Heschel that many of us are familiar with, who is buried right next to the Baal Shem Tov. So that was all in Mezhibosh. Then from there we went to Anipoli, which is where the Magad of Mezrich is buried and Reb Zusha is buried right next to him. And then, and then on the way from Anipoli to Polnoy, we, uh, we passed by a place called Ganatovka, which is where there's a mass grave of 800 Jews who were killed in 1941. And this is all just part of the journey. And then from there we went to Polnoy, which is where we saw Reb ya Yaakov Yosef, whose story I just told. From there we went to Shepitovka, which is where Reb Pinchas of Koretz is buried. From there we went to Berdichev, which is where Reb Levi Yitzhak of Berdichev, a very important scholar, uh, rabbi too in this dynasty, um, uh, where, where, where he is. And, and Berdichev is a town um, which before the war had 50,000 Jews and was the second largest city of Jewish population in the whole of Eastern Europe and 38,000 of those Jews were killed in uh, several days in 1941 and so to go to these places that have been like I said places of my imagination places where, that we associate that I associate with the Hasidic rivers without knowing or at least without having experienced the the um, second world war history and then to see how decimated these communities were was part of the journey too and not a not a part of the journey that I was um, prepared for, I suppose. From Bedichev we went to Gantof Ganatovka, which is where Reb Mordechai of Chernobyl is buried. And then we went to Kiev, which is a whole story in itself. And before we actually went into the city of Kiev, we, um, we went to Babi Yar, which um, many of you know what happened at Babi Yar. So it was an incredible journey. It was only really a week. And so... Um, wow. Wow. What? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> So I want to share some of this journey uh, with you now. The journey uh, starts in Uman. I, my, the battery in my camera was, was dead when I was in Uman, so I only had two pictures which were taken on my Blackberry. So this is the seal, and this is the grave of Rabbi Nachman of Bratzla. Yeah. Can you make it full screen? Uh, and then from there, uh, we went to Breslau. This is um, a little Hachnasa talking. This is the view from the cemetery in Breslov over the, the, the Bhagavad River. And here is the grave of Rabbi Nata. It must have been rewritten over. No, I don't think so. I mean, he died in. Rabbi Nathan died in 1810, so it was, you know, he died in 1810. This is um, filming in the forest on the way to Mezhibosh. We filmed uh, some stories which you'll see actually in the movie. This is where the Baal Shem Tov is buried. That's the what's called the Ohel. Wow. And there's the Baal Shem Tov's grave. It's a Poniftara of Israel Baal Shem HaKodesh. It's a Kutoya Reina Leino Amein. This is the reconstructed synagogue of Baal Shem Tov. How many of these... Kalaki? Kalaki. 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 This is a quite quick slideshow. So let's... Um, just, uh, this is the interior of the Baal Shem Tov synagogue. Uh -huh. Mm. This is and this is the Bug River, which 
Buddha. We spend a little time with the Bhagavad Gita. Buddha. 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 But again, there's so many stories about the Bhagavad Gita talk tank. This is our the cameraman on the left, our driver Yuri in the middle, and Chuck, the filmmaker, is on the poly. This is where the Maggid of Mesrich and Rav Zusha are inside here. His um, uh, Maggid of Mesrich is great. Rav Zusha, that's also Maggid of Mesrich is great. That's Rav Zusha. This is the Kanatovka uh, um, where the memorial the road is. You're just driving along the road. There's like miles and miles of forest, and then you see these. He's a uh, memorial. This is Vladichev, the grave of uh, Kedusha Levi. Mm -hmm. And his name there, you can see Rabbi Levi Yitzhak Ben Sara. Mm -hmm. He's always known by his mm -hmm. name. This is the current synagogue the, for, in, in Vladichev. Um, barely functions. They have a minion some days of the week of Mincha. They don't even have a minion on Shabbat. This is Babi Yar, which is uh, just this huge ravine um, where 200,000, I think, people were really massacred. The only thing more than just says, the bloods of your brother cry out from the earth. Kiev, Kiev. This is uh, Boda Kamenitsky, yeah. um, a very evil man, but seems to be a national hero in Ukraine. <laughs> lots and lots of churches in Ukraine, many of them were destroyed by the communists, but um, a lot of them have been rebuilt in the post Soviet yeah. Ukraine. And they, they're quite yeah. stunning, really. This was a very traditional Ukrainian dinner, and the, the guy behind me is um, one of the two chief rabbis of Ukraine. This is Shalom Alekhi. Very similar. This is a Podol synagogue, a synagogue that's, that's very active. There's a yeshiva there, and, and they have Minyanim every day. Um, Final resting place in the Great Russian Top is real essence is beyond time and space. That's an image of the Russian Top. So that's the slideshow. From Google, where else? A couple of, of, of comments. Before, and I'll take uh, any questions. Oops. Yeah, but I think that, um, <laughs> and if, if uh, any anyone with technical skills can try and work out how to get this video playing while I'm talking, that'd be excellent. Pop the DVD out and put it yeah, back in again. What was that? Pop the DVD out. Pop it out, did you say? Yeah, yeah. yeah it was Pop eject. it out and put it back in again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking for the eject on this one. Sorry. It's Guys, not sorry. Mac. Can't... You have to press the button on the side. Oh, that's right. Was that what? <laughs> <laughs> yes. There was there's some stories about her and and and, uh, and then they they had just one daughter, Adel. So, um, you know, there's a, ra a Jewish renewal rabbi called Leah Novak who Novak who's done a lot of work around. The women, but, in, but but it's 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 true that primarily the in the Hasidic dynasties we hear much more about the men than than about the women. Um, I don't know much about the Baal Shem Tov's wife. Do you? Well, it's, it's a famous story about her. Well, not a story, but so the Baal Shem Tov, when his wife died, she said he was very great, great attached to her. So he said that. When I when my wife was alive, I thought I could fulfill. I, I thought I could go to heaven like Elijah the prophet, but now I know I have to go the way of your earth into the earth. You will return. So, mm -hmm. so that's how I thought it was what if you could take him up to the highest levels. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's cool. 
So I, I, I want to say something about the time that we had in Kiev, and then I'll go back a little bit and talk specifically about the Baal Shem Tov and some of what I, what I think I've learned from him. Um, is it hot? Should I put the fans on? Is it In Kiev, there are not one, but two chief rabbis. The whole notion of chief rabbi, I think, um, is entirely the fault of the British Empire. <laughs> there was really no such concept as chief rabbi, right, Bill? I mean, until, until the chief... It's not true? I mean, I guess if you talk about... Like in Talmudic times, yeah. okay. but it's a, it's it's a weird it's a weird institution, and, and it's it's weird because the nature of European countries is that for um, places of public office, if they want to talk to the Jewish community, they need someone who's got an official position. So post-Soviet um, Kiev, um, the first rabbi to actually go was originally from Brooklyn. Um, a Hasidic rabbi from the uh, Kalina, um, the, the Kalina Hasidic sect, uh, Rab, Rabbi Yaakov Bleich, um, was the first rabbi to go back to Ukraine um, once um, after the, the Soviet uh, regime ended, and he has the title Chief Rabbi of Kiev and Ukraine, and. Um, a phenomenon that's, that's that's really started in recent years is that actually um, there's there's quite a lot of reform progressive Jews in Ukraine. In fact, there's approximately 13,000 and about 50 synagogues throughout Ukraine that are connected to the reform movement. And so, when I started my rabbinic journey, I was actually in rabbinical school uh, in London, and there was a student there, a Ukrainian student there, called Alex Tuchovny. So Alex Tuchovny became a rabbi. He went back to his, his city of birth, to Kiev, and um, the World Union of Progressive um, Synagogues actually gave him the title Chief Rabbi. The, the official title of Rabbi Yaakov Bleich is the Chief Rabbi of Kiev and Ukraine. So now the World Union of Progressive Synagogues gave the title to Rabbi Alex Tuchovny the chief rabbi of Kiev and Ukraine for the progressive communities. And it was an entirely political thing so that those communities would have a voice and be represented um, when there were official matters of state within Ukraine. So it was very interesting that this guy who uh, I'd, I'd known years before in rabbinical school is one of two chief rabbis of Kiev and we had, there's a picture of us having, uh, having dinner with him. Um, there's also a funny story which I wrote about which was that apparently there is no such thing as what in England we'd call a laundrette and what in uh, <laughs> what in America you would call a laundromat. There are no public places to wash your clothes. A, a, a little, you know, something you might need to know if you ever go to Ukraine. <laughs> and I needed to wash my clothes because I'd actually packed very light for this trip and then you know, Chuck decided that actually for continuity he wanted me to be wearing the same shirt for the whole week. And, <laughs> and so I had like a pile of, of, of clothes and I was sitting with the chief rabbi of Ukraine and he said, I'll take your clothes and wash them and bring them back to you. <laughs> so I'm very proud of the fact that the chief rabbi <laughs> did my laundry for me. But, um, so, why do I, why am I talking about the, I, you know, I think for me, part of this journey was about the, the modern reality of, of the community in Kiev. The fact that um, a, a community that was once, you know, how many Jews in Ukraine before, before the war, Bill? Oh, probably... Two million? Uh, more than a million, maybe two million. Two million, yeah. A approximately two million Jews in Ukraine before the war, right? And now, the most generous estimates would say maybe 300,000 which is actually quite a lot of Jews, but in the whole of Ukraine, it's a huge country, right? And so most of them are in, in, in Kiev, 
and most of them are pretty aging population at this point, right? But there's also some, some, a certain amount of revival and renewal coming. So it's like, we interviewed for the film both of the chief rabbis of Ukraine. Chief Rabbi Bleich didn't know that we were interviewing Chief Rabbi Dukovny. <laughs> if he did know, he might not have agreed to do the interviews. I don't know. But what's so fascinating is that if we're talking about the influence and the legacy and the history of the Baal Shem Tov, who is such an important figure, not just in Ukraine, but, of, but throughout the whole Jewish world, there's this sense of, well, who, who is his influence for? So clearly, for someone like Rabbi Bleich, who is like deeply, deeply, deeply immersed in the Hasidic world. He runs a yeshiva, he's, you know, he's, he's a, you know, I don't know, fifth generation from a Hasidic uh, dynasty. He's like, you know, definitely, definitely in that world, um, but came from America. It's like, it's, it's, it's very clear that because whatever, whatever sect of Hasidism you are part of, the Baal Shem Tov is the beginning of all of that. The Baal Shem Tov is where it all starts, right? But then, you know, this other guy, this Alex Duchovny, a liberal rabbi, like what, I mean, what's, what connection is he going to have to the Baal Shem Tov? So we're starting, so he's telling us on the interview, and I hope that some of this gets into the film, about the experience of growing up in um, Soviet Ukraine, having no access to Judaism, not being able to practice Judaism at all, the thought of him ever being able to be a rabbi was like so far from his consciousness, it wasn't even just a remote possibility. And yet, he, here he tells us that his grandfather um, was, um, was, a, was a Hasidic rabbi. And that so growing up, he heard from his mother all of the stories, all of the nigunim, it was, and it was so much a part of him. But for him, being brought up in Soviet Russia, where there was no actual practice of Judaism, he wasn't practicing any kind of halachic, legal-based Judaism, but, but from his, with his mother's milk, he was getting Hasidic melodies and Hasidic stories, and they were so much a part of, of who he was. So when things opened up and he had an opportunity to go to London and study, and, um, and it wasn't... I mean, I don't want to get too far into the details about why he wouldn't have chosen an orthodox path or whatever, but so... You know, even though he's, he's very much a liberal rabbi, he feels so informed, his Judaism feels so informed because of his own cultural heritage by Hasidic Judaism. And so I think it's really, you know, I tell that story because I think that this notion of, um, this notion of the Baal Shem Tov and the notion that we, most of us here, you know, um, defining ourselves as, as, as fairly liberal, Jews, um, and not necessarily, I mean, I hope in some ways, yes, but not necessarily feeling part of that Hasidic world. It's very different to the Judaism that most of us practice. And so sometimes we create notions of what Hasidism means, what Hasidut really means. And it's, it, it seems to mean something very specific, a very, very ultra-Orthodox way of being, you know, we haven't chosen to be a part of. And yet, there's something about the essence of what Hasidic teaching and thought really is that I think is absolutely um, connected to all of us. It's certainly connected to me. You know, the, the whole um, path that I have taken to come back to Judaism is very much um, being a part of, of, of Hasidic Judaism. So part of this movie and part of our journey into Ukraine is trying to kind of define who is the Baal Shem Tov? Who is, who is the Baal Shem Tov? <laughs> well, when I first came to Boulder, so, when I first opened my mouth in public, <laughs> that actually was Chayel of the day that the Baal Shem Tov's birthday. So, I said, I'm not married, I'm kind of looking around, and, you know, I'm, I'm observant, but kind of flexible. But I have one stand, and the stand is, I, will, I, I won't even consider dating somebody who doesn't think the world changed in the Baal Shem Tov. <laughs> <laughs> What, what were we going to say? So, has Sinatism started in the Ukraine? Okay, so that's, that's a great question. So, Abe's question was, did Hasidism start in the Ukraine with Baal Shem Tov? So, the word Hasid, 
right, comes from the, the same root as the word chesed, which means loving kindness, mm -hmm. or, or compassion it's sometimes translated as. Mm -hmm. And so there's, there's a definitely, throughout rabbinic literature, the term chesed is used a lot. In the Mishnah, we have a very important uh, Mishnah, the beginning of the fifth chapter of, of, of Tractate Brachot, that says, uh, that talks about a group of people called uh, HaChasidim HaRishonim, the early or the first Hasidim. And, and, and we're talking, you know, probably during the time of the Second Temple, so, you know, 2,000 years ago. And what did the Hasidim HaRishonim do? They would sit for an hour before they would get up to pray, and then they would pray for an hour, and then they would sit for another hour after their prayer. And so what seems to be being described is some kind of contemplative practice within the Jewish world. So that's part of what being a chassid is, is being, uh, having a more contemplative spiritual um, practice within, within a Jewish context. So that's, that's one thing. And then the term chassid also comes um, throughout the, the Talmud, even in places in the Talmud where we're talking about very uh, specific um, laws of damages and things like that. Talking about responsibilities, like um, in, in Baba Kama, the, the tractate that's, that's talking a lot about personal responsibilities, saying, well, if I'm, if I'm um, discarding uh, waste, I mean, it's a very environmental message, actually, for us. If I'm discarding something that I don't want anymore, like, w when is it, like, no longer my responsibility? How far out of my domain do I have to put it? Um, and, then it and then the Talmud talks about, but if you're a chassid, you bury it deeply into the ground, right? Or, so, 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 so Hasidism, the way it's defined in the Talmud, is having an extra level of stringency, an extra level of saying, here's the, here's the halacha, here's the law, but I'm going to go out of my way to go deeper into the law. So I think that's the essence of what Hasidism is. And then, and then there were the Kabbalists in the 13th, in the 13th century um, in France and Spain, and then a revival of, of, of Kabbalah big time in Sfat in northern Israel in the 16th century. And in the 15th century in Germany there was a group of people called the Hasidei Ashkenaz who were also a kind of mystical sect, but they were in that time. But when, when we're talking about Hasidism as we talk about it today, and when we talk about someone being a Hasid today, we are primarily referring to um, groups that evolved from the 17 and 1800s in Eastern Europe. And, and Ukraine was the biggest center of it, but also in Ukraine, Poland, you know. Yeah. Lithuania, where my family are from and where I bet a lot of your families are from, m most of my family are from Vilna, mm -hmm. um, was actually where the Vilna got on. You should be in Misnaga. Exactly. Yeah. So, so the, 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 the word, the term Misnaget Right, mitnaged in Hebrew is like an opponent or someone who's in opposition. So the mitnagdim were people who were fiercely opposed to what was going on. This radical, ridiculous movement of, of, of people like jumping up and down and people like, you know, pouring out their hearts and singing and, and going into the woods and dancing. I mean, what, what nonsense, like what an aberration from what Judaism is really all about. I mean, I'm, I'm exaggerating it. But the, 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 the Vilna Gaon, um, who, you know, a very, very important rabbi in, in, in Vilna, who according to my family story I'm descended from, um, was, was an opponent of the Hasidim. So I, I actually um, find it somewhat amusing that I'm involved in this, in this project tracing the Baal Shem Tov. I mean, maybe my ancestors are uh, quaking in their boots, I don't know. By now they're Hasidim. By now they're Hasidim. Right. So, um, oh, I see. Jerry's involved in trying to get this movie shown. He's so good. Okay. He's just got a Mac delivered. He says the problem is that I have a PC. I'm a chassid and he's a nugget. Or is it the other way? Is it the chassid? So the chassidim have apples? Have he's eating the apple of knowledge. <laughs> the apple. <laughs> okay, so there's a question about, about the film. I want to, because we're going to end with looking at this 10 minute um, clip. I actually, um, 
Chuck is, Chuck is very very busy, and this is the, the clip that we're going to see at the end is is by no means. I think he misunderstood what I was asking. I was hoping he would film some of the inter, you know put in some of the interviews that we've been having and some of. But really, it's just ten minutes of of, of, of me in these different places, which. I'm a little, I'm a little embarrassed because no, because that's not what the film is really about. It's not about me, but I think because I was giving a presentation, he thought that's what would be a good. So he's just edited together these clips. I mean, it's interesting because you see some of the places and, and, and my reaction to them. But but it, but the film um, essentially was a was a collaboration between, uh, if you know Natanel um, Miles Yepes, who works very closely with Reb Zaman. He's um, He's co-written some of Reb Zaman's most recent books. He was running the Reb Zaman Legacy Project, and so Natanel, I've, I have a you know a certain connection with through my connection with Reb Zaman, and Natanel and my, uh, uh, Chuck Davis were collaborating on this film. They were talking about like we need to make a film about the Barshintov. No one's ever made a film about the Barshintov. We want to make a documentary film tracing the life and legacy of the Barshintov, trying to understand who he really is. And I think Natanel suggested, well, I think um, I think uh, you know Rabbi Mark would be a good narrator. So, so they they <clears throat> they just called and asked me, and then we we started having a series of meetings, usually Thursday lunches, and started planning what, what we wanted to do. And so we, you know, we filmed um, Reb Zalman. We obviously got an interview with Reb Zalman. We got interviews with um, uh, Art Green. We went to Boston and, and um, interviewed. Um, uh, Nehemia Pollan, who's a teacher of, of, of Hasidism at, um, at Hebrew College. We spent about two and a half hours in Susanna Heschel's house in Newton, which was amazing because she, you know, her, she's the daughter of Abraham Joshua Heschel, and so, and so she's actually the great great granddaughter of the Akta Rav, who's buried wow. next to the Belsham Tov. So she was talking really? all about her, you know, and these, I was hoping I was going to be showing you some of these extracts, but. Um, You'll, you know, the movie hopefully will be out at the, at the end of the year. And Chuck Davis so, made a movie about the kosher slaughterhouse right. in Colorado that yeah. failed, yeah. but that initiative, he did another one, The Children Iowa. Stands. Iowa. In, Iowa. No, Iowa. Yeah, no, this um, is a different one. Um, yeah. And then he did a movie with uh, Children Stands with the soundtrack that was kind of the Zalman, you know, thing. So he's not yeah. new to uh, yeah. Jewish so, documentary right. filmmaking. So I mean, the, the film itself is is a combination. I mean, once we, we were, it was all interviews, and we were still talking about it. And then it was just one of our meetings, we were just like, we can't we can't do this film without a trip to the Ukraine. Uh -huh. I mean, it's just not it's not even an option, right? So then we started planning this trip, and and we went, and I I just share this story. We had this amazing meeting with Reb Zalman, where Chuck uh, Davis and I went to meet with Reb Zalman because he did a similar trip about seven years ago with one of his sons. And so we went um, to ask him about it and how we should do it. And uh, he had like all of these maps and so on. Mm. So he had like this huge map of Ukraine. And he just said, let's just all get on the floor. So Reb Zalman and Chuck Davis and myself were all just like lying around on the floor of his basement with this huge map of mm. Ukraine. And Reb Zalman is going, Oh, here's, uh, here's Mezhibod and here's Uman and here's... You know, and I wish that the cameraman had been there because that would have be been a great, a great shot in the movie. Um, and, he, and the driver that we had, this guy, Yuri, um, was um, a real character and he had been the driver of Rebzam as well. And Yuri basically, um, I mean, he has his own business. He's, he's pretty well educated Ukrainian. He speaks Russian and Ukrainian. And, and and, um, and very very good English, and he's um, which is unusual by the way in Ukraine. <laughs> not only is it unusual to hear people speak English, but there's not a single road sign that's in anything other than the Cyrillic alphabet. So if you don't read the Cyrillic, because at one point we were talking about doing this ourselves, we just rent a car and drive. <laughs> we're very grateful for Yuri, and Yuri. What's very interesting about Yuri is that he. I mean, this is a big part of what he does. He takes groups of the Hasidic pilgrims from all over the world and he takes them on these trips to, to Uman and to all of these other places to Mezhibosh and so his, his, his framework is that he's used to, he gets to these sites and the Hasidim you know will get out, they'll, they'll dove and then they'll get back in the car and go to the next site so he was sort of, um, we were 
we were on our, um, we'd be on our journey and, he, and he'd say, he'd say, okay, now we go to Hanipur. We get there, you get out, you pray, we get back in, we go. <laughs> and we were saying, well, the, yeah, well, I mean, we do, we're, it's slightly different what we're doing, you know, because we're actually, we're making a film, you know, we've got character, da, da, da. He said, yeah, 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 no, okay, so, so we get out, you pray, you make a film, we get in, we go. So every time we got to a place, he would, uh, he would kind of say that, don't play it yet. <laughs> no, no, I'm just, I want to get it full screen. So, um, it was, it was, it was wonderful time in there, and actually, again, there's a scene that I'm really hoping will be in the movie, there was one night we were actually in Mejibosh, and what's happened is around these, these places, there's a, there's a very interesting character called uh, Reb Yisrael Gabai, who is um, a chassid who's um, made it really his, his life's work to restore um, the graves of, of, of many of these chassidim. And so he's... Um, <clears throat> Keep going. Okay. <laughs> so he's set up in some of the places, like these these guest houses and things like that. The accommodations are actually extremely basic. So we were in Mejibosh and we were in this sort of um, very weird kind of hotel type accommodation. And we were there with our, our driver was, was staying with us. And um, we were just like, what does he really like? What does he really make of all of this? It's so half of his life. He's like driving people around and taking them to these places. You know, he's a he's a Russian Orthodox Christian. What does he make of it? So um, Chuck and Yuri and I had um, a nice cold full bottle of Nimirov vodka, ah. <laughs> and we sat down. Uh, Anthony set up the camera, and and I just said, "So, Yuri." Who's the Baal Shem Tov for you? <laughs> what do you make of this, these pilgrimages? Like, you, you know, and it was, it was actually very fascinating. Um, you know, half a bottle of vodka later. <laughs> actually, I will say that um, the, the, the first uh, few days that we got to Ukraine, the weather was absolutely miserable. It was very cold, it was very wet. We were in Uman, which, I, you know, has been, is this, Uman, for those of you who don't know, is, uh, you know, Rabbi Nachman of Bratslav, who was the great-grandson of the Baal Shem Tov. He died in 1810. He was primarily a rabbi in Bratslav, but he, right, you know, just a few months before he died, he, he went to Uman. And part of the why he went to Uman is because there was a big massacre in Uman. There'd been a big massacre in Uman before that. And he had this sense of wanting to, to elevate the sparks of the, of the, the Jewish souls who had been massacred in Uman. And so he went there, to, and he, that's where he died. And he said to all of his um, followers before he died that, you know, every Rosh Hashanah you come to Uman, and you come be with, with your Rebbe in Uman. And um, there's, he's also, it's one of the, the few Hasidic dynasties that, that there's no actual Rebbe. Rebbe Nachman used to always say, you know, when I, when I die, you don't need to appoint a successor because I'm going to continue to be your Rebbe. And so um, every year, 2025. This year, they're expecting 30,000 people go to Uma to celebrate Rosh Hashanah, and you know, it's it's supposedly if you're there in uh, Rosh Hashanah, it's a very very heightened experience. But um, there's something pretty weird about it, to be honest, because there's this very sort of depressed Ukrainian city of Uma, which used to have a big Jewish population, but now has really no Jewish population except for these. Uh, Breslov Hasidim, who live in a, a very separated part of the of the city, and then once a year, like twenty five thousand people come in the town and make you know, and the, the the whole economy of the town is now uh, the city is now like thriving because of it. But um, and there's a movie at the JCC right. you can take home and watch about mm -hmm. it. Oh, it's called Yippee. So we so we were in we were in Uman. We we decided because we just had one Shabbat on this trip, so we decided. Uman would be the obvious place to spend Shabbat. We thought we'd get great Shabbat hospitality and we'd meet all of these, you know, great Hasidim and stuff like that. And actually it was a very cold, miserable and lonely experience and no one really spoke to us. And it was actually quite depressing. So we didn't get invited anywhere, no one, you know, 
I mean, we went to the synagogue on Friday night. No one even said hello to us. No one said Shabbat Shalom to us. It was a very, a very, a very strange experience in that way. I think, uh, frankly, Bonne Shalom is far more friendly as a <laughs> than, than the synagogue in Uman. <laughs> This is Uman, by the way. This is the, this this is the entrance to Rabbi Nachman's grave. You'll, you'll see it. You'll see me ex explaining that experience. And so, uh, so uh, this this is this, this story is really about vodka. So basically, <laughs> we had to we had to make our own. Well, we, we found a like a, 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 a breast lover who made a business out of selling the Jewish tourists like um, kosher meals for Shabbat. So we got this Shabbat meal together, and then we were just we were cold. We were miserable. We were in this very weird sort of accommodation where there was nowhere really to sit, and there was just this long corridor. And so we, early in that day, we'd been to Nemirov, where the vodka is made. And so we we just started like drinking this vodka, and then suddenly it was like, oh, that's why people in this region drink vodka. Yeah. <laughs> suddenly, like our whole perspective changed, you know. Well, it's not just the yeah, cold, it's yeah, like, yeah. anyway, so that's, so Uman, I mean, it, it, Uman redeemed itself after Shabbat. We, a, <laughs> we actually had an amazing, um, after Shabbat, we, we were, um, I, I went to uh, the shul again in the afternoon, and then I did actually get invited to a, to a Sudash Shishi, to the third meal of Shabbat, and then I, I was trying to, I mean, I was uh, on a mission to, to, <laughs> To, to find out some cool stuff that was going to be happening after Shabbat that we could film. <laughs> Otherwise, you know, we wanted to justify our existence. And so we, uh, we, we it turns out that a very, very, very famous Hasidic uh, pop singer called uh, Lupi Schmelzer, who, <laughs> who lives in, he lives in, um, he lives in, in New York, and mm -hmm. just that Thursday or Wednesday, he decided, I want to go and spend Shabbos in Uman. And he got to, he got together a, a group of his his uh, Hasidim his you know, the people who really his group is really <laughs> and they got on a plane and they came to Uman and they spent that Shabbos in Uman and we and he's like this a real character I'm hoping he'll be in the movie but he's not in this little bit of movie here but so we we interviewed him and he sang for us and, and that was a very powerful thing but all of that was really about the vodka which was going back to Yuri who 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 really explained to us that he he said as far as he's concerned. All the Ukrainians, even though there's definitely tension, I mean, I'm not going to pretend there's not tension in Uman between this community that comes in once a year and takes over and the Ukrainian population. But, um, and, and clearly there's a, a very, very, very um, big history of anti-Semitism in, in, in uh, Ukraine. There's no question about that. But Yuri was, um, he said that, when we said to him, like, so who is the Baal Shem Tov for you? He said, oh, everybody know, Baal Shem Tov, holy, holy man, you know, great, you know. And, and started telling him that, you know, there's a folklore amongst Ukrainian, non-Jewish Ukrainians that Baal Shem Tov was a powerful healer and, and, and he really understood, or he said he understood, the whole notion of people going to the grave of a holy man to get a blessing and to, um, you know, um, put, give prayers at the graves and so on. You know, there's a big tradition and... Um, People gave me before I went uh, like you know, little notes to, to put in by the grave because there's a sense that, that the last place where the physical remains of a of a holy person is 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 where you can connect to the essence of who they are. And so, if you have like um, words that you really you know ways in which you want to have uh, someone be an intercessor for you, that's what you do. So there's a tradition of that. Um, Adele, did you have a question? You just answered it. Oh, okay. <laughs> So I want to, I, I want to, I, I mean, it's, it's an interesting concept, this presentation, because on, on the one hand, it, it is really about the film and it's about the, the journey to Ukraine, but really, you know, the way we advertised it, it's also about trying to define the essence of who the Baal Shem Tov really is. What, I mean, what are the core teachings in the Baal Shem Tov? So um, Yehudis actually knows way more about the Baal Shem Tov uh, and his Torah and his stories than I do. So. I just uh, she she just has a, a short uh, piece of Torah that is really for her defines the essence of who the Baal Shem Tov is, right? Yeah. So it's a little bit of a commercial, also you can hear why. Um, so talking about like the story of Rabbi Dov Bear with the fire in Pirkei Avot and Ethics of the Fathers in the last chapter, chapter six, 
there's a teaching, Halome Mechavero, Perak Echad, Pasuk Echad, Vila Echad, Afilo Ot Echad, Sarath and Hogbo Kovo. That means if somebody learns from his friend a chapter in Torah, a verse in Torah, a word in Torah, and even one letter, so the the learner, the student, has to give kavod, has to give honor to the teacher. So why is that? So the Baal Shem Tov asked a question. You can understand, you know, a significant, a whole thought, a chapter, uh, a verse, even a word, because word, Hebrew words have so much depth to them. But one letter? Why do you have to give somebody kavod just for teaching you one letter? So he talks about how the Hebrew letters are really the building blocks of the universe. And if a person is teaching the Hebrew just as a language, so okay, you have to go from the, the building blocks of a letter to a word, to a verse, to a chapter. But if somebody is teaching, says the Baal Shem Tov, with the fire of Torah, every single letter has a life to it. And if the letter is being taught with life, from that one letter, kind of like a, a hologram or a fractal image, you can have access. It's like a portal to the entire Torah. So without that, yes, it's only one letter. You wouldn't think you have to give somebody respect for that. But if that letter is coming from the depths of the person's soul, that the Zohar says Israel and God and the Torah are all one, then that one letter can, t can take you to the oneness of God and to the core of the Torah. So I say it's a commercial because hopefully in the fall I will continue the Hebrew <laughs> alphabet class right here and sh share some of that fire with you. <laughs> There's, there's two verses, one, one from uh, Mishle, from Proverbs, that says, Bechol dachecha da'ehu, in all of your ways know God. In all of your ways knows, know God. So, um, you know, there's various ways to interpret that, but to, for, for, for the Baal Shem Tov and for, for, for Hasidic thinking, it's like, what does it mean in all of your ways know God? I mean, even in uh, experiences that we think of as being mundane, as being not spiritual, as being not connected to Torah, as being not connected to God, as being the absence of God even, those too are opportunities to experience God. So the Hasidic paradigm really was taking what in some ways were very esoteric, Kabbalistic notions of cosmology and the way the universe works and angels and all that stuff, and bringing it right down to the pint of the year, to, the, to, to, to this notion that we, in the, way, in the way we live our lives, you know, we, we can know God, not, not in some kind of mystical dimension, but just like, you know what, something that feel, you know, the way I eat my food, the, you know, just every aspect of life has the capacity to, be, to bring holiness into it. And that's a very, very Hasidic idea. He also talks, the Baal Shem Tov talks a lot about the, the notion of Maloch Ola Aretz Kavodo, that the whole, the whole world is filled with God's glory. You know, our, those of you who have read any of Art Green's work, he talks about panentheism. Panentheism being, being what is what the sort of modern scholarly word that he uses to describe Hasidic thought. Panentheism meaning there's nothing that's absent of God. Even those experiences that we think of as negative, the people that, that, that we want to... It's like all of that is an opportunity to, to know God and to experience God. A classic, uh, in, in many, many spiritual traditions, the, the notion that every time um, we're triggered by something uh, in somebody else, that, you know, a very, very clear teaching of the Baal Shem Tov is that every time we're triggered by something that irritates it in something else, we have to take it inside ourselves and say, well, what about me? What, are, what is that person reflecting that's about me? So rather than saying, you know, just writing people off as being, you know, evil and ugly and disgusting and not spiritual and stupid and all of the, the ways in which we sometimes dismiss people in the world. It's like when, we're, when we react to somebody, it's like there's a sense that I have an opportunity to learn something about myself. That's a very, that's a very important spiritual idea. I mean, it's not unique to Hasidic thought at all. It's a very important part of, of, of spiritual life in general. But I think that these, these are some of the ways in which the Baal Shem Tov and Hasidic thought was really having an influence um, on, 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 on the Jewish world and opening people. Um, and of course the stories, many of the stories. The sto a story that um, 
think it's a very, very important story that uh, some of you may have seen those those video links that I sent out this week. But um, and it's also we filmed we filmed it, and there's a section of it here, but it's not the whole story in the forest. But the story of the fire in the forest, the story that when peril and danger was facing the Jewish community, the Baal Shem Tov would go into that secret place in the forest that only he knew. And in a special way, he would light a fire and he'd say the special words of a prayer and a miracle would happen and the danger would pass. And then in the next generation, the Maggid of Mezrich would go and find that same place in the forest. He lit the fire in the way that his master, the Baal Shem Tov, had showed him to light it. And he looked up to heaven and he said, Rebono Shalala. Master of the universe, I, 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 I found the place in the forest and I remembered how to light the fire, but I, I've forgotten how to say the prayer. I don't know the words of the prayer, but may this be enough. And it was enough. And once again, a miracle happened and the danger passed. And then the third generation, Moshe Lieb of Sasov, Moshe Lieb of Sasov went into that same place in the forest. He said, I've been able to find this place in the forest, Ribbono Shalolam, Master of the universe, but I have not been able to light the fire. I can't remember how to do it and I've forgotten the words of the prayer. But at least I found the place in the forest. Mm -hmm. May that be enough. And it was enough. And once again, a miracle happened. And then the next generation, Rabbi Yisrael of Rizhin sat in the comfort of his armchair in his living room with his, heads in, with his hand, his, uh, his face in his hands. And he said, Ribbono Shalom, Master of the Universe. I do not remember the words of that prayer. And I've forgotten how to light the fire. And I've not even been able to find that place in the forest. But I do remember the story. And may that be enough. And it was enough. A miracle happened. And I think that for me this story, and I'm trying to convince Chuck Davis to call the film A Fire in the Forest, that story is so significant in so many different ways fire in the forest. Mm. The idea that really the story, you know, when we interviewed um, Rabbi Bleich, the chief rabbi of Kiev and Ukraine, mm. without the other bit, <laughs> when we interviewed him, and I said at the end of the interview, Rabbi, do you, do you have um, a story that you think is the most important story of the Baal Shem Tov? And he said, you know what? The most miraculous story is that 250 years later we're still talking about him. Mm. Mm. And why are we still talking about him? Because there's something about the fact that the Baal Shem Tov lit a fire in the forest 250 years ago, more than, you know, 300 years ago. He lit a fire in the forest and in some ways that fire is still burning. I don't know what that fire is. It's an elusive fire. It's a, you know, I think for, for different people the Baal Shem Tov represents something different, but there's something about the influence that he had, and there's something about the influence that, that Ukrainian Hasidism had that is still influencing us. It's still burning within us. And I, so I think when I think of the Baal Shem Tov, I think of those, those stories. And the opportunity for me who, as I said earlier on at the beginning, who really rediscovered my Judaism through those Hasidic stories, and, and as an actor, and I, but, but there's something about the stories that, that, that opened me in a different kind of way. To have the opportunity, and, and, and at every single one of the, the grave sites that we visited, I told a story of that particular rabbi and, and, and sort of and had the experience of being there. There was something very powerful about being in these physical places. As I said, I, I, I thought that maybe being in the physical places, the places where the actual names, these mythical names, for me um, would take something away, but my experience, and I'm still processing it in, in many ways, and, and it'll be very interesting when we get to the stage that we put a, a voiceover track on the movie to see what kind of story we really want the movie to tell, because it's not clear yet. It's gonna be, you know, some of this stuff that you're about to see interspersed with interviews, and then there's gonna be a, a narrative voice over the top of it, and music, and some different things. It's, you know, it's, it's not clear, but, but like if, if it was my movie, and it's not, <laughs> if it was my movie, that's the story that I would want it to tell. That there was a fire that was lit in a forest 250 years ago, and that fire's still burning. And, it, and, it, and we, and, and different people experience that fire and the effect that that fire has in, in many, many different ways. But there's not, a, there's not a denomination within Judaism that's not, effect, that's not, 
you know, uh, connected in some way to Hasidism. I mean, you look in, um, I don't know about the American reform, but you look in the, um, in the English reform siddur, the English reform prayer book, I mean, in the anthology of readings that they have in the back, there's probably 25 Baal Shem Tov stories in there. So it's like, clearly, the Baal Shem Tov is not just um, someone whose influence is for people within the, in the Haredi, in the ultra-Orthodox world. He has this, this influence and, you know, as much as, as we, and especially like the, 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 the secondary part of the experience, which I haven't really talked about that much, being seeing the actual destruction and, and, um, of so many of those communities, going to Babi Yar and standing at the edge of this ravine and just building up these horrible nightmare pictures of, of, of thousands and thousands and thousands of Jews and others who were just massacred there. I mean, it's, it's so profoundly heartbreaking and incomprehensible to, to have that, that notion and those images and those memories and to, and, to, and, and to imagine just before the war how incredibly vibrant and creative and, and um, ecstatic some of those Jewish communities were and what's, what's left of them. And, and, and yet to somehow feel that there's something about the, the fire in the forest, something about the influence of the Baal Shem Tov that's still so um, relevant, I think. There was a, there were, you know, I'm gonna sh I'm gonna, we're going to show this, but I, I, just, I feel like... <laughs> no, I feel like, I feel like I've been talking for however long I've been talking, and now the film is just of me talking again, which was really not... <laughs> I promise you that was not my idea. Yes, Charlotte. Yeah. Other Jews didn't have that, and it seems, and, and in a way, it's kind of strange because it's like there's someone who tells you what to think, really, yeah. and, and, and uh, as if it's hysterically somewhat. I wonder if you can talk about it. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not your Rebbe, Charlotte. Yeah. <laughs> I don't. I, don't. <laughs> I think. Um, It, it's a mysterious part of Hasidism because if you actually look closely at a lot of the Hasidic texts, there's um, all these references how, you know, like Rabbi Nachman talks about vidui, about going and uh, vidui lifnei had sadik, like going and, and confessing before, before the sadik, and then other people talk about being in the presence of a sadik will help you see yourself as you truly are. And, and usually the sadik is a reference to themselves, to the, you know, the, 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 the sense that the Rebbe was a, a channel for uh, the Hasid in, to be able to really um, do the work that they had to do. It was almost like, I think in its ideal sense, it was really about, um, you know, many, many people in that world have, they'll, they'll, they have a Rav and they have a Rebbe. The Rav is the person they go to for halachic questions, like if they've got a question like, is this kosher, is that kosher, whatever. But the Rebbe is the person who sees their soul sees right into their soul and, um, and gives them spiritual direction in order that they can really live a more authentic spiritual life. Uh, that's the notion, I think, in its ideal form. I think that, um, you know, the critique that many people, and maybe that I would have of it, is that it becomes like imitation. So it becomes, rather than, than the Rebbe being an, a profound influence on someone's spiritual life, it becomes about very closely watching the Rebbe and imitating everything that the Rebbe does and eating the remains of the food off his plate. And there is something that's, that's a little, for me, I mean, I'm just being honest, for me it's a little, but I don't, do you have any comments on that, Yudas? Well, there's this image that all of Israel is like one organism, and just like some people in the world, like the heart, and the hand, so the Rebbe's concerned about the heart, and the head, in that sense. Being the guy. Another term that's used so, like the fire image is also the idea of, of a Rebbe being the lamplighter. So that's the idea to, to wake, waken up the souls to be able to get closer on their own. I mean, look, clearly, I mean, Yehudis and I are very good friends and we, 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 we come, you know, Yehudis is much more connected to the Hasidic world than I am. I'm, I'm sort of removed from it, but also very 
connected to it. I mean, I'm not, I've never been or see myself as being, you know, a Hasidic. I can't call myself a Hasid, but, you know, there's something about the influence. So, yes, things like that. I mean, someone like Art Green, you know, controversial figure, but, you know, he was here. Some of you know him, many of you have read his books. I mean, he, he's, um, from an academic point of view, an incredible scholar of, of, of Hasidism, but he, as a teacher and, and a rabbi himself, he's one of the things that he's really, really been careful to avoid is ever becoming a rebbe. He never, he said, I never wanted to be anyone's rebbe. It's like he, and when people want to want to be his Hasid, he says, No, you can't be my Hasid because I'm not going to be your rebbe. You know, there's a few people now like um, uh, Or Rose, you know, in, in, in at Hebrew College is sort of like, uh, you know, and. and um, Eben Leader, two people who have sort of managed to somehow make Art Green their Rebbe, but he's... So I think I, I understand your... There, there is something that's uncomfortable about that notion. But the Baal Shem Tov, I'm not sure he was a Rebbe in the, in the way that some of the, the later dis disciples and descendants of the Baal Shem Tov became Rebbe. Because he, he, was, he was sort of began it all, and that the way, you know, the stories... I mean, the story as it's told in Shifchei Habesht is that, you know, for the first 36 years of his life, he was completely in hiding. He was, and, it was a, and it's a very powerful story of a sort of spiritual um, nemesis or something. It's like, I don't know, I mean, a spiritual, um, what's the word? <laughs> what? Phoenix. The spiritual, huh? Yeah, something like that. But he, he um, you know, the stories are he was, he was like a school teacher and he was hiding in the forest and he was very poor. All the different stories about the first 36 years of his life. And then um, when he was 36 years old, he got a strong message. He had to reveal himself to the world. And then suddenly it's like, Shh, here I am. And, and, then, and then his influence was not, or, or at least the way I imagine it, because who really knows, but was not, not like... The, 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 the latter rebels, but the, there were just all these people who just wanted to kind of be in his in his shadow and hear his stories and 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 hear his teachings and hear him singing his nigunim and and go into the forest with him and experience God in nature and all of these these different things and it was a very much a, a different paradigm that he was offering at that time but I think within within two or three generations it had um, it, it had shifted a little bit that's me. Make, I'm making that up. I don't know if that's true. That's... Dagmar just asked a question about. Um, what was it about? About where they disappeared during the during the time of the Holocaust. Who rebuilt them? Who put them back together? Who maintains them now? In the wait, Dagmar, economic before... thing for the town. H hang one second. Wayne, do you you want a minion tonight, right? Wayne has yard site for his father, so okay. if if we can, uh, guys, please, if um, we'll, we'll just spend a few minutes doing questions. But if we can try and make sure we have a minion, so that Wayne can say Kaddish, he's saying Kaddish for his mother, and also has yard site tonight for his father. So that would be great. Um, so were they desecrated? I think that, I mean, there's been definitely, a, a lot of the graves that we saw have been completely refurbished in That's very recent I years. And, there, and there's been a real project to, to kind of find them and restore them. Yeah. And um, I think some of the cemeteries survived and some of them were, were desecrated. I mean, do you know, do you know, Bill, do you know anything about that, about what happened to some of those cemeteries? Uh, Paul Mann's they destroyed most of the yeah, Some of them were sort of redone, and, and I'm not even really sure whether the redoing is genuine. Right. That, that's, that's another question. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's hard. It may not it, be in the same place yeah. yeah. I, I, And I think, you know, I mean, also. It hasn't exactly been a great history for the Jews. I mean, if it wasn't the Cossacks, it was the Communists. If it wasn't the Communists, it was the Nazis and the Ukrainian collaborators. So, I mean, there are some, um, like we went to, in Berdichev, for instance, our only real contact in Berdichev um, was the, the guy who's like the, 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 the Shamus, really, of, of Levi Yitzhak, and he told us, I mean, he didn't speak any um, Hebrew or English, mm -hmm. so he spoke Yiddish and Ukrainian. And so, with my this much German, I—I I mean, again, I don't know if I'm making the video, but they, they were filmed like with me interviewing him in Yiddish, which is 
pretty amazing since I don't speak Yiddish. <laughs> but um, he, uh, we were we were chatting about um, his history. I mean, he 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 you know he said there were fifty thousand Jews here and then thirty eight thousand were killed and he was born in nineteen forty but somehow survived and is still there. But he but then we we, we left that cemetery where Rabbi Levi Yitzhak is and then he said he says. Es war ein uh, jüdischer Feld, ein anderer jüdischer Feld. So he said, was, so he said, he said there's another Jewish cemetery. So we went, and it's like this a park, a huge park. And he said in 1925 it was completely destroyed by the communists, and you wouldn't know that it's a cemetery at all. But there's one grave of a Rabbi Lieber, and I don't even really know who he is to be honest. I haven't researched it. Uh, I, I know that there are. Uh, Langsmannschaft yeah. in New York and, mm -hmm. and elsewhere, and some of these people, members, go back to their shtetl in yeah. Poland mm -hmm. and try to restore what they can, mm -hmm. yes. and, and in fact, go there periodically to take care of great right. Right. Yes, yes, I read about it. Actually, we have done something with it. Right, and there's this, this whole massive organization, I mean, they've raised, called um, Ohaleit Sadikim which is started by this guy Gabai, and he, he's, it's his life's work to restore these places. So there's many, many that he's, I mean, some haven't, like if you, if you saw that picture uh, on the slide, where well, we lost that now, the slideshow of um, Annie Poli. By the way, there's a, a, there's a book I made too. But like this, in Bratslav, you, there was a picture of that. Yeah. It's, called, it's called the um, Orach, um, uh, the uh, what's it called? Ohel? No. <laughs> no, this is the Ohel. It's it's the um, it's like a welcoming place where uh -huh. you just sort of, um, but it's like okay. brand new. And then, uh, but then you go to other places like in Anapoli, where like this. I mean, they clearly that's a very old building, which is where the Maggid of Mezrich is, and the graves there haven't been restored at all. So some of them have been very highly restored, and some of them haven't. So uh, we got it working. Huh? We got it working. So we are here in Milan and we are about to go into the Sion, into Rabbi Nathan's grave here where he was buried. He spent his last few years here and he, he said that um, people should come and see him, especially on Rosh Hashanah, and come and be with him and pray with him. And so it's a real uh, holy pilgrim inside. Rabbi Nachman was a great grandson of Rosh Hashanah, and he was a, a very, very holy spiritual master and uh, an amazing storyteller. There are stories that he used to tell and stories that are told about him. And he used to say, you know, stories, stories, people tell stories to send you to sleep, stories are to wake you up. And his stories are really about waking up the soul to really experience the truth. And so many of the prayers that are said at his grave are about opening our hearts to serve in truth, to find our true way to be. So I believe the way in is here. which is um, charity. And this says in Yiddish word, Kvitlach. Kvitlach are little um, petitioning notes, little prayers. And a couple of people back home have given me little notes that they wanted me specifically to put by Rabbi Nachman. I have two here. I want to tell you they're from. Your little notes. And uh, for these uh, Kvitlach. When I first discovered uh, Rabbi Nachman, I discovered him in the world of my imagination. As a master spiritual teacher and storyteller who really opened my my heart in a certain way to a different different way of experiencing Judaism. And 
so much of this journey is about landscapes that for me have been landscapes in my imagination and landscapes in my soul and landscapes in my heart maybe and here we are in the physical places where a lot of this happened, the, the physical places where these great rabbis lived their lives and taught their Torah and um, did all their holy spiritual teaching. So we are in Bratslav, the home of Rabbi Nachman for most of his life until he went to Uman at the end of his life. And uh, here we are in the beautiful hills above the river, the river where I imagine uh, Rabbi Nachman used to go for mikveh and near the woods where he would go for Hippolydou to be alone in the forest and open his heart and cry out to God. And uh, here we are walking towards the burial site of Rabbi Nata. Wow, so here we are walking into the Ohel, into the, the building that houses these two graves. This one is Rabbi David Svi, and he, um, he was the grandson of Rabbi Natan, and this is Rabbi Natan's grave here, Pondifta, here lies. Rabbi Natan by Rabbi Naftali, the son of Rabbi Naftali. And Rabbi Natan really carried a huge responsibility for carrying the legacy and the teaching of his, of his spiritual teacher, Rabbi Natan. As we were driving into, into Breslau this morning, I, I just was Imagining um, Rabbi Nachman and his, his students, his chassidim here, and, and uh, the, the nigun came to me that's attributed to him. stories in general take place in the forest. The story is told of the Baal Shem Tov that whenever great danger was threatening the Jewish community, the Baal Shem Tov would come and he would find a special secret place in the heart of the forest. And in that place he would make a fire in a prescribed and special way. And then there was a, a prayer, a prayer whose words, along with the fire and the secret place in the forest, had a power. And a miracle would happen, and the danger passed. Remembering the story and the legacy of the story is, is all that we really have. <laughs> we have so many amazing stories, but perhaps we don't know how to find the secret places in the forest or know how to light the fire, but we can imagine allow the landscape of the stories to imagine for us those fires burning that can create miracles in our world. Is where the Bashan Tov is buried. Call me 
Ta Hilai Slavi Israel Baal Shem Tov HaKodesh The Holy Baal Shem Tov I can really feel the holiness in this place and the Lord really powerful energy here I feel like whatever the historical truth might be about this man he has opened my heart in different ways and given me space for a different kind of Judaism, a different kind of Jewish experience and I just have so many images in my imagination, in my heart of just in the forest dancing just and just what he represents for me and for so many Jewish people of all denominations and persuasions and it feels like an amazing moment. kind of project before and, and really the I mean making a film and also it being about my genuine experiences as we arrived in these places I mean that I don't know if that'll end up in the film or not but that that really was me walking into that place for the first time but there are other places that we totally is like eh, you know another take and, and I was sort of acting walking into places for the first time and it's it's so weird to because Chuck wants the film to be really a tracing the Baal Shem Tov but it's also about my my story and my encounter and so some of those um, just watching myself some of that feels very staged <laughs> and some of it some of it doesn't you know I mean it was in fact all of the bits that he chose were me arriving for the, that was me walking into Rebbe Nachman's grave for the first time the Baal Shem Tov's grave for the first time um, yeah, and, and in Bretzlov too, the, two, the three bits that he chose, I mean, they were sequential in the, I mean, I think he just, you know, Chuck did not have much time to prepare this. I'm very grateful that he did prepare it, but um, it's not necessarily representative of the whole, the whole film at all. Yeah. yeah. Why is the great race like the Nasira? I have never seen that in Europe. Mm -hmm. it's I, I think uh, you, you see it in a lot of the, yeah, in Sfat, for sure you see it. In Sfat, you see it, with, uh, it's, it's, it's something... In Tiberias. It's, it's, it's definitely the way in Sephardi tradition, but, yes. but when people are considered to be tzaddikim, you like elevate their graves. And they were desecrated during the war? In Israel. Oh, I think they were. But this is all reconstructed. Oh, even the, the graves? I think so. so the scripts are reconstructed. Oh, totally. That's all brand new, that stuff. See, that's what I was going to ask you, because I've never seen that, because I always thought Judaism, you're, you know, put on the ground. earth to earth, yeah. and dust yeah. to dust. It's supposed to be in the ground. Yeah. That's what I was curious. Oh, yeah, I mean, that's not why his actual body, I mean, who, he's like under there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't, it doesn't appear that way. That yeah. way. Yeah. I mean, I was not, I, you know, I had, I had, um, I had no idea how I was actually going to feel walking into these places. And I, there's something about, you know, different people who've done these, these trips talked about it. And there was just something about when I walked into that room, I was just very genuinely moved. And it was kind of weird to be filmed. And then, and then at one point, you know, they, they cut and the cameraman said, you know, the light was bad. Sorry, you know, I'll have to do it all again. I'm like, I'm not doing it again. I just, that's all I got right now, you know. So we actually, that was filmed. We arrived in Mejibosh right around dusk and the light was really fading. And it's like, we just got there. And I was like, I have to go in 
you know, because they were like with the on the schedule, we were going to like do all the filming in there the next morning. But I said, well, I want to go in right now. Like we've just arrived, so they said, okay. So they quickly set up and then just actually filmed me walking in for the first time. But then the following morning, we did the whole thing again, as if I was walking in for the first time, and and various things, and none of it's. Um, None of it was scripted or anything. I mean, it was just um, just kind of me reacting and experiencing. Ruth, you had your hand up. Did you see the Ewok in this time? In the, it, for the Baal Shem Tov, yes, in that, that yes. shot. I hope that stays in the film because your, your um, reaction to it is going to be very popular. And I was especially touched by your, again, coming around the I have very limited say about the final I'll cut of this film. <laughs> Colleen, yeah. yeah. Um, so I don't understand. The, everything they know about the Baal Shem Tov is written about him by other people, not direct. Like there are no writings of his. It's a great question. Very good question. So a typical model of Hasidic texts, I mean, never mind the Baal Shem Tov for the moment, but there's a lot of Hasidic texts that are based around the weekly parshas in the Torah. And what would typically happen is that the Rebbe would teach on Shabbos, often actually at Suda Shishi, at the third meal of Shabbat. And then, you know, so it, it, the, the Hasidim who were closest to them, immediately Shabbat was over, would write down everything that they remembered. And then those would become the teachings that would then be put together in these, in these books. Very few um, of, the, of, of the Hasidic Rebbe's actually wrote their own kind of sefers. Although some of what Rabbi Nachman wrote, like Likutei Maharan, is his, I mean, it's not based on, it's not following the cycle of, of the weekly parshas, but most of the Hasidic Rebbe. But when it comes to the Baal Shem Tov, I mean, there's, you know, there's a book I have here that's called, um, this book is, it's called uh, Baal Shem Tov Al HaTorah, right? But if you actually read through it, it's, it's all the disciples of the Baal Shem Tov teaching Torah as they heard their Rebbe say. It's not actually like written by his hand. So I don't think there's anything that exists that is thought to be written by the Baal Shem Tov. So there's lots of the Torah teachings are preserved by the, the disciples and then the stories about the Baal Shem Tov are what I referred to earlier, this, this work called Shifchei Habesh, which means in praise of the Baal Shem Tov. And Shifchei Habesh is really a collection of these fantastical stories, miracle stories about the Baal Shem Tov himself. Any last questions? Yeah. It occurs to me that, of course, some, someone asked the question about if the distinction between an Arab and a Rebbe. Yeah. When I grow up, most of the jokes that I hear, Yiddish jokes, I mean, mice, were not about Rabbonim, but Rebbes. Yeah. Because there was this idea that that is the Hasidic rabbis were, were in part comical figures and also somewhat corrupt and of course there are some of these stories that go back mm -hmm. to the, the Talmud for example uh, in um, in Am Haaretzu Hasid Al Tadur this kind of thing and you don't have that about rabbis properly right. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that's true. I mean, certainly. Caricatures. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I don't really know how to respond to that, but I. There was definitely material for caricature amongst oh. because of the the, the, the the kind of life that these guys lived. Because they had courts and yeah. they had Hasidim yeah. and Mishavsim, that's Mishavtim, yeah. and, mm -hmm. and, and so on. There was, sure. There was a whole brigade surrounding them. Yeah. There was kind of a hierarchy yes. there. Sure. Oh, yes. Sure. Uh, my parents used to discuss this. Mm -hmm. 
Anything, uh, should we just call it a night? <laughs> <laughs>